All right, I think we are back and I think we are live. So I'm very excited to be able to get this started. So um, as I mentioned before, my name is Kaya Morris and I am the Movement Politics Director for Rights and Democracy Vermont. I'm really excited to be able to have this very special one-on-one -on -one chat with our candidate for Lieutenant um, Governor here for the state of Vermont, Brenda Siegel. Brenda's been a longtime friend and colleague and activist, advocate extraordinaire out there in the world trying to make a difference. And now she's going for one of the highest positions within our state government. Brenda, I'm so glad to be able to share this space with you. Thank you so much for doing this tonight. I love to be here with you both as your friend and as a fellow movement builder. Absolutely. Um, this is, these are some really unprecedented times, some ch serious challenges that are impacting people from all over the state, and it's reflective of everything that's happening within our nation. And so this is really a time and an opportunity when we need to have really strong folks that are stepping up to be able to make a difference, to really create not only the, the movement, but the modeling of like, this is how we can change this world. So um, I'm just so excited to be able to have this conversation with you. Now, as you know, fully living it every single day, <laughs> this, um, this race has been a really challenging race, not just because of the complications that COVID brings into any environment of trying to connect with individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis and really reaching out to voters as well as um, residents, locals, neighbors, and friends. There's some added elements to it that I think have made your race in particular challenging. As a low income single mother of Jewish faith, how has this race been different for you? How has it impacted your approach to campaigning and going for this particular position? So, I mean, there's been a lot of things that have been very different about this race in general than actually than my last one even. Uh, but one of, uh, with COVID, uh, first of all, I want to say that for several months, I felt like the most important thing that we could do was help Vermonters. And so we did not ask for money. We did not do that, the work that we need to do. And as a low income single mom who does not have access to money, that impacted our overall fundraising. But I really couldn't see any other path because it was the right thing to do. And I just am driven to always be doing that no matter what. Uh, so that's one thing. But also early on in the race, uh, we were Zoom bombed by uh, white supremacist, Nazi, neo-Nazi type uh, folks with drawing swastikas on the screen. And I have experienced since my last run and, uh, and throughout this race, much more uh, neo-Nazi, anti-Semitic anti type of behavior uh, than, I, than I ever had before really in my life. But what that really made me think about was how black and brown folks experience this every single day. So this is not, I'm experiencing it because I'm out in the public and that's not okay, it's unacceptable and it scares me. I'm alone in my house. I, I think about what that means for my child, uh, but the reality is, like I said, that black and brown folks are wearing that on their skin. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that they're experiencing all the time. And so that's really what that made me think about. And then as a low income single mom, uh, this race has been a really tough race with a lot of privilege. And, uh, and we may not always know that we're upholding the same systems of power, even if we have our progressive thinkers, even if we are uh, have the best of intentions, uh, that's a really heavy lift to change that work. And during COVID, we don't have those same tools that I had in the last race of really being able to be everywhere all the time and making those same connections, which means makes it possible for money to come in in a way that that is, uh, in my opinion, unacceptable. So tell, tell me a little bit more about that. So, I mean, because you, you began talking about how the start of this campaign, it really was struck very heavily by COVID in the sense that instead of doing the usual transactional piece, I need you to vote for me because I sent you the right postcard. And I see Vermonters are hurting. And so I'm going to go ahead and do actually what you should be doing. Right? This is what we would want. This is the, the, the best parts that we hope for our candidates. We want them to be out there rolling up their sleeves and actually being with the people and having a direct impact. Um, but those are not seen as values that make a right. candidate a qualified candidate or a strong can or competitive candidate. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that, and I'd like to unpack a little bit more as you speak about privilege, 
what that looks and feels like for you in ways that we might not think about um, as folks who are looking to run for office? So, you know, one of the reasons that I decided to run in the first place two years ago and now is that we have to build this path for marginalized and forgotten voices to have a seat at the table. And the reality is that that path is actually not that easy to build. And people have been trying to build it for many, many years. And we see those kind of things. Um, we see it changing piece by piece with the election of AOC and Bowman and almost Charles Booker. And you have to ask yourself, if the media had paid attention to Booker, would he have won that election? Mm -hmm. If they had, if people had acted like he could win. And so um, when you're running as a marginalized candidate, uh, you are experiencing a, a dismissal on a daily basis that feels like a magnified version of what your daily life is like anyways. You know, it, throughout my life, I've already been dismissed over and over and over again. And I've already uh, been told I can't do things that I then go forward and do. Uh, but I also have been knocked down by those beliefs about me that, that come forward. And I've also been silenced by those beliefs in my lifetime. And we, we can, that's systemic. I mean, some, mm -hmm. sometimes we don't know we're doing it, but it is by design that we want people in poverty to stay in poverty and that we keep using excuses like they don't have the experience or the movement building. But what I want to say is having experienced so many crises, if you don't know that people who have experienced these crises and found their way out and made change anyways, if you don't know that they are prepared to lead, then you yourself have never experienced a crisis. Mm. You yourself have never been there. And so that type of uh, understanding of what, what experience, that that experience counts. Mm. And, uh, you know, I have one, one person that I'm running against says in, in their advertising, experience matters. And I keep wanting to respond. It does matter. Lived experience and we don't have enough of it in the state house. And mm -hmm. so I, I want to say that that's, I think that, that, that when privilege plays in, in a way that is so serious, uh, then we really get to see the display of what access does in politics. And in my race, we are seeing on not just one, but two candidates, what the difference is for access. Mm -hmm. And and what the difference is for people who don't have it or who have been marginalized in their lifetimes. And there's two of us mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting too, because there have been some entities that have come out and endorsed some candidates and it's, you, you feel that white male privilege just floating through how all of this is touching. You see the party politics distinctly in place. It's really truly not an effort to say, we want to lift up all folks who are Democrats because that's not it. You're, you're a Democrat if we want you to be and if we choose to acknowledge that you have something of value to contribute. And also I found what you just said interesting too when we're thinking about experience. When we have a president that has zero experience in public policy and using the carrot of experience or using qualifications or degrees, you don't need a PhD in public policy to be an effective leader, to, be in, to do effective governance. Those are right. not requirements. Those are requirements that are based off of a system that still builds up on a capitalism and the complete racism of bootstrap mentality that requires that those are, who are coming with less privilege, with less finances, with less social access, um, without direct connectivity to, the, to wealth and wealthy people, it keeps them from ever being able to step up because how does exactly a single mother of a young child or a child of any age um, go through about their life having to work multiple jobs, probably going to school, getting degrees because they have been told they're not qualified enough to earn a living that's dignified, supposed to then find the time to carve out to become a public policy wonk with enough degrees and certifications that those in power will feel comfortable with them in that space. That's not what this process is about. And who do you shut down when you say you have to have this experience? And it's also important to think it's folks with experience that got us in this place. It's all right. those years of being very comfortable in their knowledge expertise that have allowed for some really 
deadly policies to be put into place and some truly harmful practices that continue to keep folks out from those centers of power. So I appreciate you talking through that. Um, I also want to highlight, you know, thinking about what that means for campaign finance and the, just the, the grotesque nature of the requirement that especially working folks are going to be required to raise significantly more than they may even be earning in their lifetime you know, within a given campaign cycle to raise more than that just to be seen or heard. That is a truly grotesque and unjust component of this political process. And as an electoral um, pool of folks that need to exercise our democracy, we have to start interrogating why we think that that is an acceptable way for us to determine who deserves to be seen and who does not. So um, I appreciate you speaking about that. I, and I'm, I'm grateful for your courage in standing up on this. Um, this is a, a real challenge. You know, speaking about a person as coming from as a woman, coming as a person of Jewish faith, we all carry multiple social and ethnic identities within ourselves. And at this time when fascism and white supremacy and sexism and homophobia and xenophobia and anti-Semitism and bigotry, all of these things are at a peak right here in Vermont, right down the street with folks that might be going to school with your kids, with people that you might have as coworkers or neighbors. It has a certain element of danger and of threat to the humanity of the individuals who are choosing to place themselves in those crosshairs those very literal crosshairs. So I know, and too many people know my story, but we're here to talk about your story. And most people do not fully understand that the toll that it takes to run for office, and especially a high office, the scrutiny, the lack of privacy, the invasiveness, the smear campaigns, the just out and out lies that grow and live exponentially, right? Having now run for both seats as both governor and as lieutenant governor, what do you believe is necessary for people to be able to run as whole people, not as individuals who have gone through the hellfire? We want them to step in strong and as their best selves are ready to lead. How do we make room for folks to do that without requiring that they break down their bodies stress their family structures, potentially weaken relationships that they may have, and take financial hits all at the same time. Um, what, there's got to be a better way. I, what are your thoughts on all of this? So there's several things that I think we have to do. Uh, first of all, I want to say that in this race, it's been, it's been brutal. I have been, uh, I have been, it has been facing this uh, barrier that I have with uh, raising money because I am a low income person. I remember Representative Summer Lee when she was at the uh, Women's March uh, event, the, she said something that really resonated with me, uh, in fact, brought tears to my eyes. She said, you know, it's really something as a poor person, a person in poverty, to convince someone with money to give you money. Mm. And it might even make me tear up right now because the reality is that it is so painful to, to you are not questioned the same way. And again, we're seeing that in my race right now that you are not questioned the same way if you do not struggle, if you are not a single mom, if you are not a marginalized person, you don't have to convince people of the same type of things. I am asked different questions and different answers are acceptable. Mm. And often things like, uh, you know, why did, well, maybe you should do the X, Y, and Z, could have made different choices. Well, I did, I got into law school. I couldn't find childcare. I didn't go to law school, but I got, I got some work. I deferred a year hoping I'd be able to find childcare. I couldn't find childcare. So I didn't go to law school. I didn't have the same access that others in, in my own race do have. And so, so I think one of the things we have to do first is understand what experience, what is qualified, what is experience. And we need to start talking about it out loud. It's a choice I've made in this race recently to really speak out loud about what is wrong with this, this, this system. This, this particular race has not been a fair fight. Mm -hmm. It's not an equitable system. And so we also need to have public finance system and we need a true public finance system where everybody runs with the same amount of money. 
because then what we'd be talking about is what we're going to bring to the table. What for, for my race, it would be that I'm going to bring the people. I'm going to bring the voices that are not heard, the unheard voices. I'm going to bring something into the committee of committees that we haven't ever seen before. And that is going to change the makeup of those committees and the outcomes of those committees. It's a hugely important thing that we have people with lived experience in, the, in, in Montpelier, whether or not they're in elected office or they're just, or they're testifying or they're talking at press conferences. So the only way to do that is to start to acknowledge the power that people are stepping into throughout their lives as experience that is legitimate to lead because we do not ask those same questions of privileged people we do mm. not ask those same questions of people who have access we do not question their qualifications we do that only to people who we already view as downtrodden we do that do that only to people who we already view as less than and the only way to change that is one to elect people who are marginalized and that means uh that means viability be damned mm -hmm. we we elect new leaders when we vote for them mm -hmm. vote for them yes to have a public finance system and three to make sure that we are in talking the reason i'm here right now talking to you is that we are talking about it honestly and those of us that have run that way that we don't hold back those feelings of of pain and um and trauma that have been caused to us by running for office, by choosing to step into leadership, that we say out loud that when the media only covers people who raise the most money, that that's not acceptable because that's them upholding a system of power. That mm -hmm. isn't telling, that's not just, that's not just, they like to say just reporting the facts. It's not just reporting the facts because there are lots of facts in my race, like that I swept the floor with grassroots endorsements. Mm -hmm. that I had in, in my governor's race, that there's no reason at all that I should have been able to get nearly a quarter of the vote in a four-way race in three months with no name recognition, but I did. That's a story that not only Vermonters want to hear, but people across the country. And why is it important to tell that story? Not because of me, mm -hmm. but because of all the people who don't know their own power. Mm -hmm. And we only, that. So that's what I think is really important. And I, I, Tomorrow we'll be talking about it actually at a press conference and being um, probably the most more open than I would have imagined myself ever being about how difficult it is to run this way because I realized in this race that we're not going to change it if I won't say it out loud and I've responded to most folks who have written me to say they're endorsing someone else for whatever reason I've responded by saying I'd love to sit down with you sometime and talk about how we uphold the systems of power mm -hmm. and what we can do to change it when this race is all over. And it Correct. probably doesn't always get read as like, you um, probably doesn't always get read as a kind response, but I'm not looking for kindness. I'm looking for change. And, and that's what we have to do. Well, the reality is, is that you are not being treated with the same kindness. That is the challenge right there. So any slight imperfections in any part of your life, your family's life, your parents' life, your child's life, your sibling's life is put up onto display and then scrutinized in um, multiple ways and ways that folks that do have privilege can do some really gross things and there's no problem about that and that they'll actually have colleagues that will stand behind them for that purpose um, rather than uplift someone who deserves to be there. Um, so I'm, I'm really grateful that you are willing to speak and speak very honestly about it because recognizing that this does exact and it extracts a great deal that it should not have to in order for someone to be able to um, find this space. And so how are we as well as communities supporting our candidates fully to be their full selves? So um, I'm very excited to be able to continue to push this conversation. Um, you know that I always come honest with that as well. So this is the thing that we're really coming down to, right? Is that real representation in our state is actually a problem. And we're a bit overdue on pushing for real representation, not representation yeah, by proxy. There are some amazing allies that will be in different elected offices, but it's still representation by proxy. There's still often individuals who do not, as you said, have lived experiences with some of the many challenges that people are facing even currently 
And so without that lens, without the, com the, the com distinct understanding, this is what it means for me to get to the, the challenges folks have been having under COVID, individuals in the disability community have been having to ration meals and been having to ration their meds and have not been able to get access to transportation and have had to self-isolate because they can't get around and don't have access to things. These are, in, these are experiences that people have been living with every single day and it's just now hitting the rest of the population. Having individuals who can actually speak about that Think about how that changes when we think about the allocation of funds and when we think about the policies that we put in place and the barriers to access to those resources that we may on some levels intentionally place to keep people from getting what they need to be able to be whole persons and have dignity in life. Um, so what do you feel are some of the biggest barriers that keep us from having that real representation? What have you seen? We've talked a bit about campaign finance. We've definitely talked about access to even influencers who will open their door or not open the door. The hedging on the fence, I'm not gonna endorse until after the general because you know they're still expecting you to again, scrape and fight and claw your way rather than saying, I believe you actually are the qualified candidate and I wanna help make sure that you get through. What are some of those things that you've seen and felt that you feel keep folks from being able to step in and have that true representation that's actually meaningful? Well, I think that first and foremost, we have to, um, or I don't know if this first and foremost, actually, one of the things we have to do is we do have to, if we're, if we're supporting candidates, say it out loud. That's you have to be willing to endorse, even if you think there's a possibility they'll lose, even if you know it's an uphill battle, even if you know all that, because just saying it out loud also begins to crack open that wall, that barrier. If we don't do that, then then we aren't can't crack, crack open that barrier. And it's, it's a huge problem for us. Uh, and then I also believe that inside the legislature, one thing that we need to do is we need to begin to have almost a standard by which we ensure that people with lived experience are are heard from and not just heard from but listened to uh, on the and the issues that are impacting them because I think it's very hard for us unless we have an intentional standard by which to actually um, t have those voices at the table we might have one or two as a token um, also I'm gonna say that we have to stop saying to people thank you so much for your voice because that is tokenizing I don't, I'm not here for your viewing pleasure. My story is not here so that you can be like, oh, did you hear her story? I'm here to run for office and lead and make change. And so are so many other people, even in our races in Vermont. We have to stop this. So this, that version of saying that out loud came from my friend, Scott Pavick, who's running uh, and is in recovery and he also has that experience of constantly saying it. And I was afraid to say out loud that same thing. And I did, couldn't find the words to say that same thing, but also was really tired of hearing that over and over again. And when he said it, it just really resonated with me. And so, because, because we have to stop tokenizing people's stories. We have mm -hmm. to start hearing them and their experience. So, so even though that's not actually to elected office, it is to our cha changing our policies. And it's not also just in Montpelier in our elected offices. It's also in our nonprofits, in our corporations, in our businesses. We have to be willing to hire people who maybe don't fit the mold of ex experience that we've always thought of because we have to remember that those are the systems of oppression. That is the systemic order that has been designed to keep those people out. And in the only way to change it is to infuse them in. Mm -hmm. And that means that's going to be a, that's scary for a lot of people, but it's something we have to do to make change. And frankly, in the Lieutenant governor's office, there is, it's one of the best places to do that work because we actually can, uh, we actually can work with people on the ground and start to bring those voices in. We can actually work with businesses and start to help those businesses figure out how to do diversify their uh, their workforce and including not just their workforce but their managers and their CEOs and their nonprofit directors and uh, and their boards and. The Lieutenant Governor's Office has this platform and ability to do that. You can w step back from the podium, you can pass the mic, and you can say, it's not my story that needs to be heard right now, it's yours, which is not a quality we see in elected leadership very often, mm. but it's one we need to. We need to start thinking of our, our leadership as a partnership, not as, I, I don't want to lead 
I don't want to lead you. I want to lead with you. I want mm -hmm. you to lead with me. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be a whole change. We have to change the way we think about leadership. So I'd love to go back. We have a little bit more time. I'd love to go back to something you said just previously that we have to stop telling people, thank you for your voice. When people say that to you and not necessarily when it strikes the wrong way, but if we think about those who have not stepped in and want to step in, how does that voice feel different for those two different audiences for you? when you think about what it means for people to step into representation? So when you're able to step into representation, it means that you're able to bring your experience to the table and help find solutions. Mm -hmm. You're not bringing a story that, uh, that it's not a movie. You know, it's, it's, I still remember in the governor's race, one of the people re reporting asked to meet me at my nephew's grave who had died just three months earlier. And I didn't know what to say. I was, you know, somewhat new. And he said, I just think it would be a good story. And I said, I mean, I, I didn't know what I was saying, but I said, well, it's not a story. It's my real life. And I haven't mm -hmm. been there yet. And I don't know if I can handle that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and luckily my very strong campaign manager said, no, you're not doing that. And we made a different solution. But the reality is that we're often asked for our stories to be the, instead of our experience, instead of our solutions. I mean, I have released some really powerful solutions. And what I know of other marginalized leaders is that they released some really powerful plans and solutions that they come to the table in testimony in those in legislature with really incredible ideas. And those ideas are dismissed because their voice doesn't matter the same way. So when somebody new is stepping in, when I'm thinking of bringing someone in, I'm not thinking of us hearing their stories and being like, thank you so much for speaking up. Thank you for your voice. I'm thinking of, thank you for your leadership and let's partner together to make that change you were just talking about because it sounds like you are the person that has the experience to make that change. I'm talking about looking at that differently. Mm. Um, when we, I'm, I'm, when I am asked to consistently martyr my own ability to survive, to fight for change, but never asked to actually step into leadership role or mm -hmm. a paid position, mm -hmm. that is an unacceptable way to, to ask for support from people who have struggled. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. not what we can do. We need to do something different. We have to pay people for their expertise. And I am an expert at income inequality and I am an expert at opioid policy and I am ready to lead on those changes and it needs to be valued. Thank you. Well, we definitely value you and I uh, know everyone at Rights and Democracy is very excited to be able to offer that endorsement and I'm pleased to be able to lend my voice to this really important movement that you're building and that we're growing off of. Um, this has been a really powerful conversation and I do hope that you will continue to reach out. This has been really amazing and thank you so much. So this is on, live on Brenda Siegel's page and we will have it so you can view it again um, as a uh, permanent video and I do hope that you will go out there and recognize there's a lot of you who haven't turned in your ballots yet. So while many have cast their votes, there are thousands of you who have not yet and you can still also go to the polls if need be to cast your vote exercise your right to vote it is precious and it is important thank you so much for joining me tonight Brenda and I'm so glad that we had this chance to connect with um, viewers across the state and I wish you all the best of luck within this campaign let's go win this thank you Kaya <laughs> thank you Thanks have a great night me. everyone yes